I want to introduce uh, a little bit more Chris Seedman to you. He's come up here and we're going to talk to Tina about relationships. Great job. Uh, I especially appreciate the vantage point uh, of, of a woman disciple maker talking about relationships the way you did. Really appreciate that. So Chris leads the church, the branch in Dallas, Texas. I'm really, really grateful that he's here with us. And uh, like I said earlier, when we began, we uh, think it's really important that practitioners talk about how to practice disciple making. So uh, grateful to have Chris with us. In fact, Chris, let's just start by getting your reaction to things. Well, first of all, I so appreciate your transparency. Um, and I think anybody who's been in, in ministry for an extended season, public ministry, uh, could really identify at a certain level. Um, and so I so appreciate it. I had several things come to mind. Just to let you know a little bit about me, I, I did not have the privilege of planting the church where I serve. I've been there 23 years, but it's a 118-year-old church, wow. and it came out of the Churches of Christ uh, in that way. The, our, the American Restoration Movement is where we came out of. I grew up that way, and so my time has been a time of transition, as you might imagine, into uh, the church has evolved a great deal in the 23 years. Um, so I could just identify just so much with, with dealing with that. It, I, something came to mind, you know, a lot of times it's a lack of communication that is keeping the church together. Everybody thinks we need to communicate so we can keep the church together. Sometimes it's a lack of communication that's keeping everybody together. And the harmony we think is more of an artificial harmony than authentic harmony. And what really COVID revealed that, I mean, I didn't know I had so many experts in my church. <laughs> I had people who are experts in election processes, <laughs> yep. racial justice, racial equity. I had virus experts, vaccine experts, constitutional freedom experts. And what's amazing is some people had expertise in all five of these areas. <laughs> and I just thought, now everybody's communicating about where they really are on all these yeah. things. And you felt the fracturing. So it just, I just thought when you talk about, you think you got John 17 yeah. rhythm momentum going on. And sometimes it's not as much as, as you think in many ways. But, um, I, I think something that really struck me is just, it just blessed me when you talked about, uh, it's Christ centered community. That's the context where love has grown. Um, and that is, that's so true that what we're disciple making is more relational than it is transactional. And when you think about so every single one of us were conceived in Christ in a moment, in a flash, you know, conception of a child happens in a moment. Formation of the child within the womb happens over nine months. And so people can be conceived in Christ in a moment, that flash, but they're formed in the context of a body or yeah. in the context of relationships. And so I really appreciate you talking about that. Thank you. Uh, one of the things that is a challenge for the North American church, when you use the word discipleship or even disciple making, people can often think, oh, we're talking about education. We're talking about Bible education. In fact, uh, because I lead discipleship.org, uh, I've been at meetings uh, several years ago, I was at a meeting and a guy met with me and he said, oh, good. I want to talk to you because I want content. And I, and I remember thinking, no, you, you don't understand. Jesus-style disciple-making does not focus on content. Content is a part of it. Like Jesus taught the Sermon on the Mount. Jesus taught the Torah. But uh, it is so much broader than that. It's coaching. It's uh, asking questions. It's imitation. It's as they walk along the road, as they lie down, and as they get up, it's life on life, heart to heart transformation. And it's so important that the North American church realize the context of relationship. Tina, talk to us, if you would, a little bit. Really appreciate you using John 13. Yeah. Talk to us a little bit more about that text and why it's important. Well, I agree with your retooling of my earlier statement, right? That, <laughs> that, that discipleship is an expression of 
the greatest commandment and the second greatest commandment that we are loving God and that we're loving others, that we're recognizing that, that this is the very best thing for you. And, you know, the necessity of all of us walking that out in our churches, we just, we just can't overstate it. I appreciate so much what, what I'm hearing from just floating from table to table about this shift that is going on in so many churches and in many of the churches represented here where you're moving away from this stage-centered model where a, a pastor is responsible for spoon-feeding truth to each person here. And as Brandon uh, explained, we're raising up mature adults who are now equipped to go out and feed that to more and more people because that, that is what that is. It's an expression of love that Christ called us to. I have loved you in this way, and I have sent you out so that you can love others in that way. No, that's good. Uh, you were going to say something, Chris? I, I, I was thinking, too, I appreciate you talking about the, the 10 women you reached out to, and you're praying for one another's families, you're in one another's lives. And just thinking about, um, and Brandon said earlier about encouraging us to take off whatever role hat we have right now and just think about ourselves as disciples and disciple makers. The reason this relational piece is so important is when we think about discipling people, you know, Hebrews 13 says, remember your leaders who spoke the word of God to you, consider the outcome of their way of life, allowing people to get close enough to us to see the outcomes, to yeah. see how we're coping with our adversity or our suffering or our difficulty. You know, people need to, I'm going to use a phrase here. People need to know that we're smoking what we're selling. What, what I'm saying is people need to know that we're really living into this and tasting of this for ourselves. It's kind of like when you think about celebrity endorsers that are endorsers that are paid incentive-based contracts to use a diet product, and they get rewarded more for the more pounds they lose so that people can see, wow, this product is making a difference in this spoke person's life. And I'm not calling Jesus a product. What I am saying is that people are more apt to believe and buy what it is that you're declaring if they see the fruit of it in your life, yeah. but they have to be close enough to you to see the fruit. And sometimes they don't really believe the quality of the light until they're privy to some of the darkness that yeah. you're walking through. And, um, you know, a lot of people get focused on first Peter three about, Hey, be prepared to give an answer or a reason for the hope that you have. And so everybody gets real concerned about apologetics and there's a place for apologetics. But that assumes that people are asking you a question, that they'll be interested in your answer. Yeah. A lot of us don't live lives enough to provoke people to ask the questions that make them want to be interested in any answer we might have. And part of that is you are living a life, and but allowing people in just like you did to say, this is where I am. And these people are able to see, wow, she's living into this and... This is how you walk through the adversity, the suffering, leaning into Jesus. And um, that's just this relational piece that I've learned over time of people being privy to how are we walking this out. Um, there's a philosopher by the name of Michael Novak who says there's three levels of belief at work in society. One level's the public. He calls it public convictions. That's the stuff you say you believe that you don't really believe. It's the stuff you say you believe to get the job, to get the girl, to get the city office, but you know you don't believe it. Then there's private convictions. That's the stuff you say you believe that you think you believe with all your heart, but it's never been tested. It's the 25-year-old with the MBA who thinks they know what they would do had they, if they owned their own business. And then they own their own business and they're realizing, oh, I, I'm not going to do what I thought I would do. So there's private convictions. You think you believe something with all your heart, but it hadn't been tested. Then he calls, there's the core convictions. Core convictions, that's the stuff that you automatically believe and you know you believe it by how you're living in a default way right now, today. For instance, I know a lot of people will believe in gravity 
and they don't ever have to tell me about it because they drive in the middle of the road when they cross a bridge. Yes. They drive over the double yellow line. Amen? Because they just default. I know you believe in gravity. We, I think people need, to, it's only in a relational context. They yeah. really see Tina defaulting. She's living into this, if that makes sense. And it's not just a something you say you believe. But let me read to you, uh, taking what exactly what you're saying, Chris, and what Tina, you're saying. Uh, Paul, the Apostle Paul is writing to Timothy. So you got to remember one of the best relationships of discipling, somebody discipling somebody else, uh, uh, actually living out Jesus' method of disciple making is Paul to Timothy. Listen to this in 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 10. So Paul's writing to Timothy, you, however, know all about my teaching, my way of life, my purpose, faith, patience, love, endurance, persecutions, sufferings, all the kinds of things that happened to me in Antioch, Iconium, and Lystra, the persecutions I endured. He says, you, you, like you've been with me, you know, this is exactly what you're talking about. And then he said, watch this. Yet the Lord rescued me from all of them. In fact, writing to a guy going through difficulties, everyone who wants to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. And he goes on, he says, but as for you, continue in what you have learned. Where'd you learn it? From Paul. Continue in what you have learned and have become convinced of. That's so good. Yeah, yeah. so good. Yeah. I, your example of Elijah was beautiful with Elisha. Because if you go a little bit further with Elisha and you read into Second Kings, Elisha is running with a company of prophets. Elijah didn't run with a company right. of prophets. He played solitaire most of his ministry and, and it got him in the wilderness alone. And, but he passed that mantle on, but there was something, Elisha caught on and he runs with a company of prophets, which is kind of cool. Yes. And, and so I love that what you were saying. Um, Tina, I, I want to, um, ask you, this came up earlier about families. Not only are you discipling women, in the church context, you're building relationships with women. You have seven children yes. that you're discipling. Amazing. Talk to us about that. Is that really a divine number, seven? Hey, you you know? <laughs> yeah, I, I love that that question was asked because that's, that's been a, a major thing in our family. Um, my husband and I do have seven children. They range in age from five to 19. And um, because nine years ago, we planted a church became very evident that our whole household had to be on board with this. Um, and so today, people call and ask us to come and speak about family discipleship because they look at this family and we're all on mission together. You know, I've got kids who are in the worship team and on the student ministry team and in the children's ministry wow. team, and we're all doing it together. Um, and, and so I am just very honest with people and say, I would love to tell you that we had this pre-planned strategy, but the truth was when our church started, we were just the only people there. And so it was all hands on deck. You know, the 10-year-old had to learn to play the keys. The nine-year-old had to learn to play, play, the, play the bass. And the eight-year-old needed to rock babies in the nursery. But um, I, I don't like this idea at all that we neglect discipleship outside of our home because we are discipling in our home. So I think people often err in, in one of two extremes, either I'm not going to sacrifice my family on the altar of ministry, right? Heard that one before. Or I'm not going to sacrifice my ministry on the altar of family. And then you end up with a scenario where the cobbler's kids have no shoes. You know, that's why there's this negative stereotype about PKs, because they're the undiscipled children who are acting a fool in the church because their dad's busy discipling other people. And I don't believe that either one of those two extremes is true, what, what we practice in our household is we bring our family along, right? That's what Jesus did. He didn't just call and commission. He said, walk with me and let's do this together. And so that has been uh, born from necessity from starting a church where my family was basically the only people there at first. But our kids had to just be on mission with us. And so rather than saying, I'm sorry, I have to sit you on the sidelines while I go disciple others, 
We believe that they are part of our discipleship team that God uniquely built our family together because he knew that my husband needed me and I needed him and these children needed us and we need them because we are all we're all like-minded and we're all doing it together and uh my kids have been asked to to speak with me before and say how do you feel about this right because if if you're a preacher a pastor a pastor's wife you've got kids um you probably, if, if you're still raising them, fear what will they feel about the church when they're grown. When I have the opportunity to talk to an adult pastor's kid, first thing I say is, how do you feel about the church? I mean, obviously, my number one concern is that my children know Jesus, but it's also incredibly important to me that my kids also love the church. Man, I love the local church, mm-hmm. and I want to see that in them too. And so I have always uh, given my kids an open platform, speak truthfully. You know, if you say something that uh, that kind of impugns your dad and me, then maybe we'll find out we, we owe you an apology, right? But, but what they have shared, so I'm just going to repeat from their perspective, is no, they don't resent it. Yeah, we're an all-in family ministry crew. I mean, my kids are at church four services per weekend, you know, but they they say we don't resent it because our parents have just always been authentic about it. We don't love the church while we're at church and bash the bride when we get home. The bride's difficult sometimes. That's what I just shared with you. I dealt with people who tried to completely split it and murder me in the process. But it wasn't about them. That's about Satan because he hates the church that we love. And so being honest with our children about that and teaching them to delineate between the souls of men who God deeply loves and Satan who wants to destroy everything and everyone that God holds dear. I think, I I just think that we don't have to to go to one extreme or the other, uh, neglect outside relationship because, or discipleship because of what's in our home or neglect discipleship in our home because of what's outside. I think they, they work together. And I believe if we will give God the space to show how he has created a perfect scenario in our homes for that, that he can show us, he can show us the way. That's, you know, uh, relationships where you're involved with people and you're involving them in the mission of Jesus are really the ideal. So I I can tell you like uh, my kids, same thing. We, we, first of all, when we thought about planting a church, my wife did not resist it uh, at, at all. She's like, yeah, she's, totally on board with that. And I thought that to me at first, I was like, wow, she really got on board fast with that. It's not, not usually doesn't do that, but she was getting on board with it. But I found out she was part of a church plant growing up. So that was normal for her. And then with our kids and your kids to be involved in, they're seeing this is normal. Yeah. And to normalize discipling relationships is so great for our kids. I want to punctuate something. Uh, and Chris, I'm going to get you to jump into this. We had this same conversation in uh, Dallas and Houston. Years ago, I was given an opportunity. I was finishing up my Master of Divinity degree, and I was able to do an independent study. And I asked my professor, uh, his name is uh, Dr. Richard Oster, Rick Oster. I said, Dr. Oster, I'd like, to, I'd like to really do an authentic dive through the New Testament and ask this one question. If we're really being biblical, what is the, the things we're going to emphasize? And so uh, as I'm working through it and reading the New Testament, trying to have fresh lens, try to fresh eyes, reading it and reading it and reading it, something stood out to me that really uh, became influential in why I am very committed to Jesus-style disciple-making. And that's this. As I was reading through the New Testament, I said, what would a church emphasize if a church was being really biblical? And it just, it, it hit me on the side of the face. The church would emphasize the way we love one another. Here, let me give you an example. In 1 Corinthians 13, the Apostle Paul is trying to make this point. So he begins, and he's talking about spiritual gifts. And he said, if I had uh, uh, spiritual gifts, he said, if I could speak in the tongues of men or even of angels, but I don't love, I'm nothing. And then he says, hey, if I was really smart, if I had insight and divine knowledge, to know all mysteries on planet Earth. And I was really a smart guy, really knew doctrine, really knew the Bible, but I don't love, I'm nothing. 
And they says, if I really want to be missional and social justice and literally surrender my body to the flames, but I don't have love, I'm nothing. And then he goes through all these things you could think would be important. And then he ends 1 Corinthians chapter 13 by saying, three things remain. Faith, hope, which I would think like faith has got to be a thing. Faith, hope, and love. But the greatest of these is love. So when Jesus says, by this, all men will know you're my disciples, if you love one another the way I have loved you, so you should love one another. Love is so important in the eyes of God. So when I'm discipling somebody, I keep going back to what I learned with my kids, and that is with my kids, I, I, I just realized, you know, you can be the best parent on a planet, but if your child doesn't think you really genuinely care about them and have a relationship with them, it doesn't matter. So when I come home and I've realized, oh, I've been going hard all day, but I guess been, I, I kept telling myself, the relationship is everything. The relationship is everything. The relationship is everything. When I'm discipling somebody, it's the same thing. The relationship is everything. The relationship is everything. So when we talk about intentional, relational disciple making, the relationship is everything. Chris? Well, I think that one reason the relationship is everything is, you know, Second Corinthians 7 says it's the kindness of the Lord that leads to repentance. Now, just think in place of repentance, change, any kind of change. It's not the argument that leads to change. There is something that happens in the relationship. Um, and a relationship is needed in order to traffic in grace and truth. When you think about Jesus, he came from the father full of grace and truth. And part of this journey uh, of discipleship involves both grace and truth, but it takes the relationship. And it's interesting to see Jesus, the way he walks this out with his own disciples in the course of three years, you know, with you see this in Matthew 16, Jesus tells Peter when he makes the great confession, you're the Christ, son of the living God. Jesus says, blessed are you, Simon, son of, son of Jonah. Flesh and blood didn't reveal this to you, but my father who is in heaven, which by the way, you know, thanks be to God, the Holy Spirit is with us in disciple making. It's not all up to us. Amen. Yeah. There's a great witness to go with our witness. <laughs> you know, um, he says, I'll be with you always, Matthew 28, 20 after he gives the commission in 28, 19. But he says, Flesh and, uh, my, my father in heaven revealed this to you, my identity. So there's, he was affirming grace in his life, even changes his name, though he was far from a rock. <laughs> changes his name. That's a show of grace. But what's the very next story? Very next story is Jesus pulls out his job description. I'm going to suffer, be rejected, kill, raised to life. Peter takes him aside and says, uh, that's not the messianic job description. The messianic job <laughs> description is to kick Roman rear. Right. <laughs> and he rebukes Jesus. Do you remember this? And Jesus says, what? Get thee behind me, Satan. Okay. By the way, he looks at all the disciples when he says that, not just Peter. Peter's just saying what all the disciples are thinking. And he says, you have in mind the things of men, not the things of God. So back-to-back -back stories, Jesus shows him grace. Holy Spirit's at work in your life. Changes his name. Beautiful thing. Then says, you have in mind the things of men, not the things of God. Rich young ruler, Mark 10, Jesus looks at him and loves him, the text says. Then he calls him to do something very difficult with his wealth. A woman caught in adultery, John 8, neither do I condemn you. Grace, go now and leave your life of sin. By the way, it's possible to be a person of grace and still use the S word every now and then. But again, you see Jesus, this interdependent relationship of grace and truth happening in his relationships, but it takes a relationship so often for it to, to happen. I think trying to do discipleship from a stage 75 minutes a week, it's just not, you know, everybody wants the pastor or the Bible class teacher or the small group leader to be the pundit to deliver heaven's opinion on very personal issues. And it really takes relationship. Relationship is the currency in yeah. for grace and truth. And, um, 
And that takes time. I'll say one more thing about relationship with Jesus, with his disciples. I so appreciate Brandon talking about method, talking about the method. You know, Jesus spent three years with his disciples. By the way, I take great solace in this, that the disciples didn't really understand what Jesus was about for three years. They thought he was a political messiah. Right. And yet Jesus still uses them to raise the dead, heal the sick, and preach a message they still didn't understand. I remember that on my days when I'm like, man, I still fully don't get this stuff, but he can still use me. Yeah. Amen. Yeah. <laughs> but even after he comes back from the dead, they're still asking, are you going to restore the kingdom to Israel? Are you going to make Israel great again? You know, Acts 1, 5. And so they're still struggling. And so it's a relational thing. But one of the most beautiful things is, is watch what he does with Peter, James, and John. You know, a lot of Jesus's ministry, building a relationship is sharing a plateau, a flat place. So much of the gospels, he's teaching around a dinner table. They're eating together. They're walking along. Then he begins to take Peter, James, and John to what I call a peak experience in his life, a mountaintop. Takes them up, Mount of Transfiguration. Powerful moment of glory for Jesus, I think. It made his heart come alive. But then he also takes Peter, James, and John into Gethsemane, which is, you know, the meeting of Gethsemane is Olive Press. He takes him into the place of crushing. And so I... I think of building a relationship as you, sh- you start out by sharing plateaus, you know, hobbies together, dinners together, hanging out together. But then you start taking people into what makes my heart come alive? What makes your heart come alive? Take them to peaks, but eventually you also take them into the pit, which is what you did with your 10 friends. Yeah. You take them into the pit. Even Jesus did in Gethsemane. And over time, that relationship gets formed where you can continue trafficking in grace and truth. So I think this relational thing, loving one another is so critical. Tina. Well, and I'll build on that. Jesus, you know, on this Mount of Transfiguration, my husband pointed this out to me recently. He said, you know, he goes up and he meets with Moses and Elijah. And and why? The law and the prophets, right? But why else? Because like you mentioned, Elijah, he was isolation man. He was doing this thing alone. Look at Moses. You know, Moses was one who God spoke to like he spoke to no one else. Moses, I mean, man, Numbers, I feel like is one of the hardest books in the Bible to read because these guys just give Moses such a hard time for all these chapters. Moses and Elijah were two men who ministered in in such isolation and endured such difficulty. And then Jesus, when he's getting ready to walk through the most difficult thing that he's going to face, goes and finds solace in meeting with two leaders who are uniquely like him in that. They have uniquely walked through isolation and persecution, and that's where he finds solace, but then he brings along his two closest so that they can see him in fellowship, and they can know how to fellowship because they're getting ready to walk through just as much hardship and persecution as they go out and take the gospel to the ends of the earth. So what an example he sets for us in a time when certainly he would have wanted just to be alone and process and pray about what's getting ready to happen, but he meets with other isolated leaders from history, and then he takes his closest friends along with him. What's curious about that with the closest friends is in Gethsemane. I'm so glad we're talking about this. You know, this is not about perfection. You you are apologizing to people that you're discipling. They're apologizing yes. to you. I mean, Peter, James, and John, they fall asleep on Jesus God. in his time of greatest need. And so this is very much about direction more than perfection. Yeah. Yes. And I think it's important. For me. Yeah. So let me uh, uh, just ask everybody to pause for a second here. And I'd like to, you to think about the people that you're discipling, giving, given what we're saying about what Jesus did with relationships. And I'd like us to realize what, and think about what does it take to build authentic relationships? It's going to take time. Uh, like some, some relationship things we just never get to because we don't invest the time. And it needs to be time. It needs to be things that are fun. It needs to be things that are natural. It needs to be things that are are in many ways non-churchy, just because they're they're such high. 
I remember once I took a guy to a hockey game and uh, we we're at the hockey game and the conversation that we had afterwards, this happened multiple times. It's like, he said that was the best conversation he's ever had about spiritual things. And it happened at a hockey game because that's where life happens. We used to, to uh, say with our kids that quantity time is the context in which quality time is created. Right. Mm-hmm. Amen. And so as we're thinking about, and as you're thinking about your discipling relationships, what is it that you're doing to develop relationship from the texting to the, the scheduling, the, the discussion times to the fun times to the life on life times? And again, Tina, thank you. Thank you. And Chris, thank you.